Okay, we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone to the event crowdfunding the new age of venture capital or an invitation to fraud or disaster. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge some of our advanced degree association students who <clears throat> had the idea of putting together this program on crowdfunding. They approached me and they said if, if, if this was a good idea and, we, and I said, I think it is the best idea we can have on, on this topic, and I'm glad that we're making it happen today and that we're here with the panel that we have. <clears throat> Special thanks goes to Antti Kuha, Olivia Jackson, Odette Oz, and Guilherme Perez Potenza from Finland, the UK, Israel, and Brazil, respectively. I think this topic is particularly interesting for our international students. We're always looking here, you know, what makes Silicon Valley different and distinct from the rest of the world, so it comes at no surprise. My name is Evan Epstein. I'm the executive director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance here at Stanford University. It's a joint initiative between Stanford Law School and Stanford Business School. And our focus has always been to look into corporate governance, into different uh, initiatives and in a cross-disciplinary environment where we can have leading academics, business leaders, policymakers, practitioners, and regulators that can meet and work together. And this is why this event on crowdfunding is so exciting for us today. It's a cutting-edge topic. We have some of the major players with us here today. It mixes innovation, securities regulation, startup financing, and a brand new market. As most of you know, the JOBS Act was signed into law on April 5th of 2012 with bipartisan support to encourage funding for small businesses by easing various uh, securities regulations. Included in the act is the Crowdfund Act, which will allow equity crowdfunding by non-accredited investors under certain conditions. Now, President Obama has called equity crowdfunding a game changer that will, for the first time, allow ordinary Americans to go online and invest in entrepreneurs that they believe in. Now, despite some delays, the SEC is expected to propose the detail rules enabling this category of retail investment in the coming months, although that's anyone's guess. The panel will discuss their arguments seeking to gorge the potential crowdfunding to, one, improve startup finance, two, assess the risks of mismanagement and fraud, and three, review the implications of the crowdfunding exemption for the overall securities regulation framework. I'll introduce the speakers now. First, to my right, I have Naval Ravikant, who's the CEO and a co-founder of AngelList. AngelList is a leading social network platform for startups and angel investors. It taps only into accredited investors for now. Um, more than 1,000 startups have been funded since 2010. They have over 100,000 startup profiles, and they have raised over $1.1 billion. I think this month they've raised almost 11.5 million and have made over 4,000 intros. I don't know if that's correct, but yeah, I, I they're, looked up they're little mangles. Uh, it's now uh, it's about 120,000 startup profiles, 5,000 sophisticated investors. Uh, we move about 10 to 20 million a month. The alumni have gone on to raise 1.1 billion. It helps to have Uber and Pinterest and a few other companies having gone through. Okay, excellent. It's always hard to keep up. That's okay. Uh, so, I'll Mr. Ravikant also previously co-founded Opinions, which went public as part of Shopping.com and also Vot.com. He is an active angel investor and has invested in dozens of companies, including Twitter, Uber, Dogverse, and Jambool, both sold to Google, and Mixer Labs and Fluther, both sold to Twitter. Then we have Rory Eakin, who's the chief operating officer and co-founder of CircleUp. CircleUp is an online private company investment platform. They provide accredited investors free access to direct equity investments in high-growth consumer product and retail private companies that were previously difficult to identify and access. They've raised over $7.5 million for nine companies since launching mid last year, and I think both um, Naval and Rory bring together different uh, platforms that are really interesting to discuss today. Rory is an experienced investor and advisor, most recently serving as director of investments at Humanity United, part of the Armadio Group. At, Huma at Humanity United, he invests in small businesses and social enterprises on a global basis. Rory is also a former consultant with the Boston Consulting Group, where he worked in the financial services, technology, and consumer practices. Rory received his MBA from Stanford University, so he's one of ours, uh, as well as a public policy degree from Princeton and a master's degree in international relations from the University of Cape Town. 
And to my immediate right is Professor Grunfest, who I guess most of you know. It's hard to introduce him, but Don't try. Go with him. <laughs> But he is the William A. Frankie Professor of Law and Business at Stanford Law School. He's the senior faculty of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. He's a co-director of Directors College, which is the nation's leading venue for continuing professional education for directors of publicly traded corporations. He is also a former SEC commissioner and a co-founder and director of Financial Engines, which is traded in NASDAQ, and a director of KKR, which is a major private equity firm. So I think you'll all agree that we have a wonderful panel to discuss the topic. So first, uh, Naval, I'd like to for you to talk about AngelList and your general views on crowdfunding. We'll go one on one, and then we'll open it up a little bit to, to deeper discussion. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short since you already covered a lot of it. But we have a lot of products on AngelList in the equity fundraising space. Uh, the bread and butter is introducing startups to VCs and angels. Um, and that's something we do all day long. We drive about 300 introductions per week between startups and investors, and all the actual closing activity takes place uh, offline. Uh, recently, we've been experimenting with a broker-dealer partner, uh, Second Market. Uh, we've been allowing small dollar investments from people completely online, so they can do one, two, three, four thousand dollar investments completely online. These are accredited investors only. They're run through suitability checks, and the companies themselves are heavily screened uh, by a second market, and usually have a lead investor. And because we're sort of tiptoeing into this, we want to make sure these are companies that could have raised money anyway. Um, so that sort of starts segueing into what true equity crowdfunding will look like. Uh, and in that one, we did about uh, $600,000 in December of last year and almost $4 million in January. Um, and these are all fairly small checks, a couple of thousand bucks each. Um, and so we're sort of learning <clears throat> what crowdfunding may look like if it were the, the market-based solution, if you will, but for accredited only. How long has AngelList been around? AngelList has been around since February of 2010. That's when we launched okay. it. Okay. Um, so it's pretty young. Okay. Rory, maybe you can talk about Circle Up. Sure. So Circle Up, uh, as introduced, is a, a private marketplace for high-growth consumer companies to raise capital from accredited investors. We launched in April of last year, and came together around a simple premise that the market for private company fundraising is incredibly inefficient. Our background, of the team comes from private equity in the consumer product space, and was consistently seeing high-quality companies below the threshold where private equity would fund uh, them, so sub-10 million in revenue. And without outside of the technology space, there isn't a, a Silicon Valley or Sand Hill Road where these companies can uh, efficiently raise capital from a concentration of investors. So we, we put together Circle Up within the existing securities framework underneath a broker-dealer model. It's only accredited investors are able to access the platform and review the investment opportunities. We've completed nine financings so far, over uh, $8 million now being raised by, by the companies on the platform. And we do use the, the crowdfunding term. We, we believe we are the, the largest equity-based crowdfunding site in the country. Uh, we're the first to do an online transaction start to finish. Uh, so the investors can complete their transaction, wire funds to dedicated escrow account, and sign documents all online. And what we've seen is this means a small business, I'll, I'll use a, a real example, a company here in the Bay Area, uh, 18 Rabbits, a granola company with $2 million in revenue growing 100% a year, can meet investors at, from Seattle, Washington, Brooklyn, Florida, all across the country and, and interact with them through our platform, an online forum, video chat, and raise capital uh, much more efficiently than, than ever before. So we're, we're excited about the introduction of, of technology to make uh, angel investing more efficient and, and look forward to sharing more about that. Okay. Joe, maybe you can introduce the term crowdfunding, define it, sure. and maybe also describe so, the, the so, categories. So a couple, a couple of observations over here. It's important to recognize what Naval and Rory are doing is entirely legal to the best of my knowledge uh, within the current structure of the federal securities laws because what they're doing is they're going out and they're raising money from individuals who are accredited investors. And the accredited investor test, for those of you who, who are uh, you know, not practice securities lawyers, um, typically is a bucks test. It's you have enough money. If your income is sufficiently high, if your assets are sufficiently great, you can then qualify as an accredited investor, and you can wind up participating in some of these, these, these uh, uh, opportunities that are available. Uh, now, from that perspective, I think it's important to recognize that, in my view, 
there's a tremendous future for using the internet in order to facilitate investment. That does not mean that there's a tremendous future for the thing that's commonly called crowdfunding, as that term is used in the Jobs Act. Why is that? What's the distinguishing feature? Crowdfunding basically, in theory, will allow people to raise money up to a certain limit from individuals who are not accredited investors. And the general idea is that you'll be able to sell small amounts of equity in a retail-oriented market to retail investors. Based on everything that we know about how, se how successful capital formation actually works, that may be the least likely model ever to succeed on average and over time. So in other words, Rory's model and Naval's model can well turn out to be huge successes. And there are going to be many innovative ways to, to, to leverage the power of the internet in order to match the right sources of capital with the right opportunities for that capital. But that doesn't mean that opening it up under the crowdfunding rules as enacted by the JOBS Act um, will wind up being good for the vast majority of America's retail investors. One small statistic, all right? And, you know, if you look at seed, seed financing in Silicon Valley, and if you just look at the average, and the average is going to be highly misleading because there are all sorts of different ways to do seed capital financing in Silicon Valley. 60.6% of these seed rounds, which typically involve accredited investors, never get follow-on financing. They do the first round and they die. Okay? That's 60.6%, and that's with accredited investors who are presumably sophisticated Silicon Valley types, uh, and they're not dumb money. Well, if that's the kill rate, all right, in a situation where you have smart, sophisticated money doing Silicon Valley deals, and, and by the way, of the 40% that raise another round, the vast majority of them ultimately fail too. The vast majority of Silicon Valley deals do not succeed. This is a hit-driven business. It's a small percentage so, of the companies. I'm sorry to interrupt, but my hit rate is worse than that. <laughs> I think okay. in my portfolio, it's probably about 75% die. Yeah. Uh, I think the stats are worse than what you, people might have in print because there's a, uh, there's a bias to not report in when you die. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. This, this so is there's a survivor bias. Right. Right. Unless, of course, you're in Chicago, in which case you vote. All right. <laughs> and, and also with the, with the recent run-up in valuations and the recent froth in investing activity, those stats are going to get worse. So the, so the actual death rate is quite a bit higher. You, you'd basically have to have, in today's angel investing scene, you'd have to have probably 15 to 20 companies in your portfolio to have one solid winner. But the nature of the market is such that, that if you do get that one solid winner uh, and you're not dealing with adverse selection, uh, then you can pay off the entire portfolio and then some. I think Naval's, Naval's view and mine is exactly the same. That said, I will take the other side of the crowdfunding debate just for entertainment because we're going to watch me get steamrolled by Joe Grunfest. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm relatively neutral on crowdfunding. I think uh, it, it, you know, the, the non-accredited crowdfunding uh, is not going to account for a lot of dollar volume. Uh, the majority of the volume in the market will continue to move through funds and VCs, just like in Wall Street, the majority of the, mark, uh, the dollar volume moves through mutual funds and hedge funds. Uh, but just like there's a retail investor on Wall Street who can go in and sort of basically gamble their money and gets taken advantage of by the brokers, um, you know, that same opportunity is going to exist in these markets uh, or, or could. Um, and if you can go and, and... This is a reason to do it. Well, if you can, if you, you know, that's not a reason to do it, but I'm saying if you can go gamble your money in, in Vegas and if you can go play with futures and options and commodities on Wall Street... Um, then why can't you take up to 10k a year and there are crowdfunding caps and use that to support a local business? And I'm not really saying Silicon Valley style, but um, there's you know friends and family, someone's business that you know really well. I think Rory, the, the kinds of companies that Rory serves on the consumer goods side are actually much more uh, apt to do crowdfunding than you know a classic Silicon Valley tech startup because you don't know if Mark Zuckerberg is Mark Zuckerberg or he's just a kid in like a stained T-shirt with Tivas that's going to steal your money. Um, so I think for certain kinds of businesses where the consumers have intimate knowledge, they're putting small amounts at play, uh, there may be something, something there. And I think that just to pick up, and thank you for that, one of the reasons we focus on consumer products is 
we believe we, we want to put investors in a position to succeed. And one of the tenets of that is understanding what you're investing in. Not everyone has a, a, an electrical engineering degree from Stanford and can understand the next cloud computing technology. But consumer products are a much more accessible sector of the economy. And even within that, we do growth capital. So companies with $1 million in revenue uh, or above, which means that their products on the shelf. They have customers, they have vendors, they have suppliers. You, as an investor, can conduct your diligence by walking down to the grocery store, seeing a product on the shelf, trying the product yourself. Uh, we think that these are elements that begin to a marketplace to start by helping investors understand uh, the assets they're investing in and would be key to any crowdfunding expansion. Maybe, Rory, you can also talk about the diligence you do on the companies that go on your, on your uh, site. Well, another part of it is the curation that the platform right. is able to provide. We think that's critical to a successful crowdfunding model. So the background being professional investors in the asset class is, is critical. Uh, we've had over 600 applicant, uh, applications to join the platform, and just 2% of the companies uh, are permitted onto the platform. Uh, this actually brings up a, a policy point of view because right now, as written in Title III of the Jobs Act, it's not clear that the funding portals will be able to uh, do that same curation. Uh, as curious yeah, as it, it may seem, it might the be SEC that, that will be fatal to crowdfunding uh, if curation is not allowed. So, so the balance that the SEC has to walk and what makes this a really difficult set of laws to implement, which is why if they pull it off in 2013, I'll be <laughs> shocked. Uh, the balance they have to walk is they have to make it difficult to defraud someone, but they have to create no adverse selection. Because if one winner out of 20 accounts for all the returns, and that's usually the most easily funded company and has the most options. If you give them any reason not to use it, they won't use it, and then you lose money the old-fashioned way by betting on a whole bunch of losing, losing horses. Um, and so I think that's the balance the SEC has to strike, and I consider that a nearly impossible balance. Well, and the, and the curation is one a key part of it, so having the portals be able to determine who is permitted on the platform or not for a variety of, of human decisions, you know, investing their judgment on the platform, and then investors make their own independent judgment whether to fund it once it's on the site. But the law also has a number of other restrictions that may make it less desirable for an issuer to raise through that exemption versus a Reg D-506, including audited financials if you're raising over $500,000, and a number of reasons why, as a company, you might choose to go on angel list or, or circle up through a fi Reg D-506 than a crowdfunding in, in the sense of the job. Yeah, there's document. also an unresolved liability issue. There was sort of a tort lawyer giveaway in the Jobs Act that uh, essentially, um, I, I don't understand it fully, I'm not a lawyer, you know, I'm a product code guy, um, but uh, from what I understand, it, it, you can pierce several liability shields um, if you handle it improperly. So uh, you have an uh, affirmative obligation to disclose everything. Um, and uh, so unless there's some sort of checklist the SEC can provide saying, if you go through this checklist, then you're protected against liability. Uh, then I don't see why any good company would use it because th they might have directors sitting on their board who are millionaires or multimillionaires and have too much personal exposure. Um, so it comes back to that stat Joe threw out, which is I think basically investors have to understand that most of these companies are going to fail. They have to develop a nose for due diligence. They have to work with good offline investors. And then if there's any adverse selection on either on the platforms because the platforms are taking a fee or on the curation, um, or because of the law, um, or because of disclosure requirements, or because of liability requirements, then we'll all lose money the old-fashioned way, just by picking bad bad bets. But but you know, bottom line, you guys are having success working within the current model with accredited investors, uh, leveraging the, the the connectivity made available through the internet, um, and you know you're, you're exercising discretion. You know you're curating. Uh, both of you are very proud of the opportunities that you offer to investors who come to your site. Um, and the risk and the danger very simply is that you're not going to be able to replicate that level of quality control um, in, in the crowdfunding area. And, and I think that's the real danger. Yeah, I think for, the, for us, you know, the way we work is quite different than Circle Up. We're at a much earlier stage. Um, and so we rely much more on investor signals for due diligence, like there's a good angel already committed to the round, putting their own money in. Um, and of course, we do a light screen for the companies we feature, but in general, angel is a little bit more like LinkedIn, where anyone can create a basic account. Um, and so for, for us, 
we can't protect the investors from making bad investments. But we'll, what we look for is if you're going to be an investor in AngelList, you better have some experience losing money. Um, so the, we don't want to be the first place where you come in and lose money, or you know that's a very traumatic experience for anyone who's recently become an investor. When the first startup comes back and says, "Oh, sorry, you know we're shutting down," you're like, "What? I thought this was going to be great. You didn't tell me anything. You've been gone for 12 months." So we don't want to be the first place where somebody loses money. And so a lot of these crowdfunding investors are going to get an education by fire. There's a flip side to that argument, though, which is uh, you know John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins famously said, "It takes 25 million dollars to." train a venture capitalist, to crash a fighter plane to, to train a VC, essentially, because they're going to lose the first few investments that they make. Well, if they're going to lose in the first few investments they make, isn't it better if it's in you know $2,000 chunks instead of in $2 million chunks? Um, so that would be the flip side of that. Maybe you can talk about the, the caps that are included in Jobs Act to limit the risk, right? The, the $1 million that you can raise through crowdfunding, the $2,000 as an investor that or 5% of the net income. What do you think of that? those, is that strike a balance? Is that useless? What do you think of that? Joe? Well, you know, if you, if, if you take a fundamentally flawed idea and you limit the extent to which you can actually implement it, I guess that's progress. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there there are a variety of caps. Uh, you know, you can only raise a million dollars a year. Uh, you know, in reliance on the crowdfunding uh, exemption, uh, investors, if they have annual income or net worth below a hundred thousand uh, dollars, their investment in crowdfunded securities is capped at the greater of two thousand dollars or five percent of your annual income or net worth. So, if you're making a hundred thousand. Uh, you can only blo blow $5,000 a year at this craps table, but interesting question, who's going to aggregate your investments across all of it, you know, and, and so how does that enforcement mechanism wind up working? Uh, and if you've got annual income above 100000 uh, then uh, it's capped at 10 percent of your annual income or net worth. But if you know the accredited investor rules, you become an accredited investor as an individual at $200,000. So it, it kicks in only for that one to two hundred thousand dollar space, right? As an individual, um, yeah. So so uh, you know, yeah. The, the law is a dog's breakfast of negotiating compromises. Frankly, right. <laughs> you know, we got to see some of the sausage making up close in D.C. and it wasn't pretty. Uh, so maybe, you know, it just it, it it reminds me of 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 you know an old joke among producers in Hollywood. All right. So Evan, tell me, what's the most expensive movie ever made in Hollywood? Any, anybody know? I'm sorry? Uh, no? Waterworld. Waterworld was way up there, but it actually wasn't the top. Hang on, let me, let me get the list over here. Hang on. It's got to be some Kevin Costner. It's got to be some Kevin Costner. No, Water, Waterworld was up there. Actually, it's Pirates of the Caribbean at the world's end. All right, that was $300 million. Appropriately named. Okay, yeah. It, it's, it's, no, that's true. I'm looking for Waterworld over here. It's actually down the list. Um, because prices have gone up. Actually, the joke in Hollywood is that the most expensive movie ever made was Driving Miss Daisy. All right, now why? Why? Driving Miss Daisy was made for seven and a half million dollars. All right, um, between worldwide box office and rentals, it made a hundred and ninety-five million dollars. All right, uh, if you do it as a multiple on return, that's a twenty-six x. That's pretty good. All right, so why do people in Hollywood say it's the most expensive movie ever made? Because right after Driving Miss Daisy, the amount of money that was invested in the next Driving Miss Daisy, I've got a film that we can do for $5 million, and we're going to get a 26X right on that film, was huge. Everybody was chasing the idea of the low-budget Driving Miss Daisy. All right, and, and you know, the, there's a sense in which people already have the idea that if you allow crowdfunding, you'll be able to be the next driving Miss Daisy. And, and all the data and all the experience suggest that's not going to happen. Oh, that, that phenomenon happens in the venture capital side, Absolutely. too, which is they'll fund some great breakout company and then every other VC funds some clone. And, and, the and combined, Facebook. they actually lose more money than the winner makes. So it, it's uh, the Warren Buffett story about airlines, right? I mean, he would have shot down the Kitty Hawk to save investors a lot of money. Let me take the, the longer view, and, and, and I point out some of the challenges I think that will, will come from a policy point of view. But 
Let's start with a, a story, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or, or not, but, but Jeff Bezos, when the, when the Kindle first came out, and everyone said, you're crazy, no one wants to read on, on ink, uh, e-ink, and, and on, on a device. Everyone wants to hold a piece of paper. This, this quote that I've always held on to was, do you really think in 50 years the most efficient way to spread ideas is going to be to walk into a forest, cut down a tree, take it to a milling plant, wait six months, and send books all around the world through freight, uh, through trucks and, and trains. It doesn't make any sense. And he was ahead of a curve on, on a digitalization of, of media. If anybody's raised capital ever in, for, through a private company or any other uh, business, it doesn't make sense. You have, a, you have a pitch deck, you drive from venture capitalist to angel investor, person to person, you answer the same questions, you have a private meeting. There are lots of risks, and we've, we've talked about them, how to mitigate that. And, and by the way, you can only access less than 3% of the population that you know to be an accredited investor because they're the only people who can possibly understand the nature of this business. I don't think that that makes sense in, in 10, 20 years time businesses across the country are going to be financed in that mechanism. And I think what Naval is doing, hopefully uh, other platforms like that, are beginning to, to make a process of capital formation for small businesses in the country more efficient, more effective. There are lots of risks, and we need to figure them out, and we need to protect it, both investors and startups, absolutely. But we're at the early innings, I would argue, of, right. of a transformation and, of digital as a change. I agree there's going to be a tremendous transformation of the capital formation process because of the internet. But I would wager it's not going to look like the crowdfunding provision of the Jobs Act. What we're going to come up with will be something very different that will look more like what you're doing at Circle Up and what Naval is doing at AngelList than like the model that Congress. I mean, do you really con trust Congress to be the venture capitalist for America? I have my doubts. I'd rather have you, Rory, and you, Naval, come up with the models that might work than the people that so, are driving so, us. So let me, let me tell you why I think even the downside scenario, and I, I actually think the answer depends a lot on how the SEC writes the rules. Um, and there's also this big question of when. My guess is they'll punt it as long as possible to the next commissioner, the next commissioner. Um, but I think the downside is mitigated, not just by the caps, but also by the fact that in this day and age of the internet, it's actually pretty hard to pull off outright fraud. Mm -hmm. Um, and the easy way to see that is Kickstarter. So Kickstarter doesn't have the greed element. You don't feel like you're going to make a million dollars investing in a company on Kickstarter, so it doesn't draw as much greed capital. Yet Kickstarter moved, I think it was $320 million last year, um, all online, uh, no physical beatings involved. And it's pretty easy for me to come up with ways that I think I could scam Kickstarter, where I could create a fake identity and a fake million dollar campaign and you know, pull in lots of $1,500 contributions or whatever and then make off with the money. But in reality, I don't think there's a single actual recorded case of actual fraud on Kickstarter. Um, or if there was, Kickstarter did a great job covering it up. <laughs> very, very important point. And to follow up on that point, let me ask everybody a question to everyone in this room. How many of you have your pebble? No, no, absolutely not. And I'm not suggesting that failure is fraud, OK? But let me ask the question. How many of you have your pebble? Right. Okay. Actually, what is what is the fine line between failure and fraud? If well, you don't try very hard, is that how you define it as fraud? Well, no, 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 no. I listen, listen. What if the risk is I'm going to sit on my butt all day long and not do any work? I, I am. Look, I, I am the first person in the world to support the right to engage in honest failures. All right. But here, but here, here are some questions that need to be asked, and here are some observations. The failure rate, and I'm not saying the fraud rate, there's a big difference, the failure rate on Kickstarter appears to be large enough, high enough, that Kickstarter has, without any pressure from the government, changed its policies. How have they changed their policies? What do they require now? What do they prohibit? Well, they won't let you have 3D renders. Now they require you to basically uh, proxy the risks. Right. They, they are now actually requiring risk disclosures on Kickstarter. That looks like an SEC disclosure requirement, all right? And this is not an SEC-regulated market. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because there's enough stuff on Kickstarter that fails, all right? And let's assume that every failure is honest. Not my intuition, by the way. I'm a little bit of a suspicious kind of guy. Maybe it's the people I hang around with, okay? Lawyers. Uh, <laughs> you know how they are. Stanford 
Stanford grads. I'm, it's, I'm tormented. Um, so, so we now have Kickstarter adopting of its own volition SEC style risk disclosures because they know that the incidence rate of failure is sufficiently high that it could wind up polluting the entire idea of the Kickstarter market. If you have a marketplace and if, it, and, and if you have you know, 100 opportunities to buy a Pebble watch and 99 of them fail, your marketplace is going to fail. Yeah, I think the real question here is does it end up like the NASDAQ or does it end up like the pink sheets in the OTC? Where people don't trust it, it's the penny stocks, the junk, you know, everyone in the know knows it's a trick and they stay out of it and every newcomer gets fleeced once before they graduate to the, to the real well-lighted safe place to conduct business. And so I, I think that's the question. And one problem could be, you know, we could do everything right. Like I could say, all right, we're going to enable crowdfunding. We're only going to do it for companies where there's a top tier VC investor. They're only opening up 20% of their round as a thank you. Um, you know, we'll vet every deal. He's going to do tons of diligence, dig through their spreadsheets, uh, put in his own money. We could do all that. But there are 400 crowdfunding platforms right now being built or, or talked about. Or there are 85 on AngelList alone trying to raise money. Have I so told you about driving? Meta. Have I told you about driving Miss Daisy? <laughs> yeah, Have I mentioned exactly. that? There are, there are more people building uh, pickaxes and shovels and, and blue jeans than there are actually miners out there. So they could soil the space, right? They could ruin the reputation. And, and that, is, that is what I worry about. Where we, we want more regulation or more oversight. You, know, you just said a clean, well-lit place. We're, we're one of the first people to say broker-dealer oversight. FINRA has a system in place for overseeing the sale of securities. They can work within the rules and prevent the more freelancing uh, of, of the platforms that, that don't uh, follow the rules. And that in that way, protect, at least put some, some guardrails around the industry overall. We think that's important uh, from, from a site to, to have the, the appropriate oversight and licensing so at least the more rogue actors aren't, aren't reputationally affecting the sector overall. So, so Navel, we know you, you were pretty involved with the Jobs Act. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that process. I know it was a, a very different and special process and, and give yeah, us a bit so of insight. Yeah, I believe Rory was too. That's where I met him. I kept running into him in the halls in D.C. and that's <laughs> when I got suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Knew something was up. Uh, you, know, it, it, you guys are giving me a hard time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's legislative stuff. So. And, and, and I remember when I told Joe, uh, you know, oh, we're going to go to D.C. and we're going to change the law. <laughs> <laughs> Joe thought the odds were low, <laughs> and everybody thought the odds were low. Uh, but it was sort of a magic confluence of uh, the Congress and the President wanting to do something bipartisan. They needed a bipartisan win. Um, there were uh, a lot. There was a little bit of it in every uh, for everyone. Um, so there was bits in it for Wall Street with easier IPO on ramp, and there was bits in it for Facebook and Twitter with a 500 shareholder rule. Um, the crowdfunding was sort of the crowd pleaser. The Title II lifting, general solicitation ban was, you know, good for hedge funds and so on. So everybody had a little something they liked. So kind of all the special interests sort of at least got out of the way. Um, and the president pulled it from the White House, and the Republicans pushed it from Congress. Uh, and it was, I, th I think it's kind of the only really bipartisan bill of the last four years that got through. Um, we did our bit by, we had an online petition that got signed by 5,000 investors and entrepreneurs. Um, we had lots of people in lots of states who called in favors and talked to the center, talked to their congressmen. Most of them were not doing it for crowdfunding. There was definitely a, a, a bunch of people doing it for crowdfunding, but everybody had something they liked. Um, I still don't think it would have gone through, by the way. I, I think it was a, an extremely difficult thing to get through, except that some, I, I still don't know who this anonymous person is, but some genius named it the Jobs Act, uh, jumpstarting our business st startups. When it, you know, it's not directly about mass job creation um, or not immediately about mass job creation. So, uh, and no, no one can vote against something called the Jobs Act. <laughs> Just the ads that are going to run against you in re-election are terrible. Um, so that was a brilliant bit of marketing that, that helped get it done. Uh, but there were a lot of people involved. Um, and I got to see how the inside of how uh, Washington works and stay at Stanford, stay in Silicon Valley. <laughs> That's all I have to say to you. So how do you think it's going to affect uh, the venture capital market itself, if any? The general solicitation rule affects the venture market more than the crowdfunding piece. I, I don't think crowdfunding will ever move the dollar volume into classic tech venture deals that it will significantly impact the venture capitalists. And it certainly won't impact the deals they care about. Um, so I think it's going to, uh, the, the VCs will be affected much more by the lifting of the general solicitation ban means that companies will be out there uh, yelling from the rooftops that they're raising money. 
um, there will be less blown private placements because of an accidental reporter, um, you know, puts out an article, um, which still unfortunately happens. Uh, and a lot of companies accidentally violate those rules every time they get up at a demo day, and you know, their investors cringe. Um, so I think uh, that part will will and, and you will actually see VC funds publicly raising. That one will be interesting. Um, there are a lot of VC funds who approach me about raising on AngelList, and I'm already skittish about that. Raising but, their own funds. Yeah, you? correct. But once the general solicitation ban lifts, then I think you're going to see there will be forms of VC funds that will essentially be advertising publicly for capital. I have the same view on, on the disruption of VC industry overall. I mean, fundamentally, companies want to raise more than just capital. They want support and advice and value add. And so in the technology space, that comes with a, a, a very small audience and then a lot of technical advice for the most part. Um, it's not true in all industries. And, and again, towards consumer, one of the ways we try to add value to our companies and believe we, we are adding value is, is in a consumer product space. It's a lot around marketing, distribution, growth. We have partnerships with folks like General Mills and Procter and & Gamble and ways to help small companies scale where it's less around sitting in a small room with a highly technical problem from, a, from an angel advisor uh, who's also financing your company, but how do you scale a business out in a marketplace? Customer evangelism, support, it's a broader way of adding value to a company in a different uh, sector on, on its growth curve, uh, which is why we think that those are the industries that are, are more suited for, for crowdfunding at the beginning. I, you know, my view is not all money is created equal. Uh, that uh, if you are an entrepreneur and if you're trying to grow a business, uh, I would much rather have as investors people with experience, uh, people who not only have put their money at risk, but who are willing to have me call them up and ask uh, questions and people who can give me advice. Um, and that kind of assistance, assistance especially early on in the development uh, of a company, uh, can be extraordinarily valuable. Uh, and again, this just may be my view, but, but I'd rather take more dilution and have smart people who know how my company succeeds than have less dilution and raise $100 from you know, 10,000 people that I'll never meet uh, and you know, whose advice I would in any event never take. Yeah. The most important thing, uh, the most important trend in this industry in the last five years is that the cost of building a company has collapsed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as that has happened, uh, the number well, wait, of people... In, in the internet space. Yeah, but it's all going internet. So now we're seeing hardware companies get launching well, uh, mini satellites and UAVs on $500,000. Right. Um, we're seeing enterprise software companies doing consumerization of enterprise. So it's actually only... Uh, if you're trying to put a man but in the But the moon. kinds of things that Rory is doing. 20% of the U.S. economy. That's what uh, I'm talking about. Uh, but, but what I'm saying, okay, so let's get, let's get back to Silicon Valley for a moment. Um, the, the, the lower cost of building a company, or at least building a product, means that you can reach out to many more people for fundraising. So the definition of who can be an accessible investor is growing. Um, so there are a lot of unsophisticated investors who can now move the needle on your financing. And venture capital is traditionally the bundle of advice, control, and money. Um, and as an, as an entrepreneur, you want the advice, you want the money, you don't want, necessarily want the control and the oversight that comes with it. No one likes to have a boss, no matter what they say. Um, although one as articulate as Joe might be welcome. Uh, but so I think this is forcing an unbundling and VCs are being forced to compete on their merits and show that they're offering good advice and they have less control over companies than they did traditionally and founders are keeping more and more control. Uh, and the money is being valued as money. Uh, you know, venture capital is the business of buying money wholesale and selling it retail. Um, and you better mark it up somehow. You, you can't have it be completely commoditized and venture capitalists are extremely good at that. But I think smart entrepreneurs are now starting to unbundle. That said, there are VC firms who offer that unbundling, who come in, they say, we know we're just money, but we're going to do our diligence and then we're going to put in our money and get out of the way. Um, so the entire market is being restructured and this is going to be just one small piece of it. Crowdfunding will probably, so with all the money that could possibly come into crowdfunding, if it blows out beyond our wildest dreams and you know, like $100 million a year flows in through crowdfunding, um, that's just like one Russian billionaire walking into the market. But look, I if 100 billion, <laughs> if so much money billion flows in through crowdfunding, I suspect 120 million will flow out. Uh, There's that you know, too. And if you think about the dynamic, so so you know, in, in, you know, at Angels List, a large part of the system works through a combination of curation and signaling. Yeah. That if you get a smart angel and you trust their views, 
all right, you will follow that angel, okay? Well, you're not going to have that in crowdfunding. Right. Why not? Right? Well, uh, what, I mean, if you, if you, well, how would that work? Because, you know, my, my image of crowdfunding is you, you get the great unwashed masses, you get undifferentiated people, all right, that wind up uh, investing in the deal. Well, so we, we don't assume right now that even the accredited on our site who are doing the online through broker-dealer um, are all that sophisticated. Just because just you have a million dollar network doesn't make you a genius. Um, so the only deals we expose to them are the ones that already have venture leads and have the rounds mostly filled out. Um, so that's the curation function okay. that we do. So that's one example. And I'll go, I'll go to bat for them, the great unwashed masses, <laughs> uh, to, to say that yeah, the they accreditation... Look pretty, they look pretty washed to me. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the accreditation standard is not the, the sole proxy for sophistication. Sure. I, I can say, although we are only with accredited investors, but the, the quality of investors we've come, that have come through the platform, people we hadn't otherwise known, there's a bit of a, a self-selection process. People who have been in the consumer industry for a, a long period of time, who have gone up, exited successfully a, a, a consumer company or a family office that's been active in the space that are now finding deal flow through Circle Up. One anecdotal experience, not a, a big empirical study, but there's there value-added investors that are coming through a platform, and I don't think it's just because they're accredited. It's because people want to invest something they're passionate about and, and what they know, especially when exposed to the risks on the financial mm -hmm. side. It's not just financial return. It's being but, supported. But Rory, your differentiating characteristic is you're highly curated. It's harder to get onto Circle Up than it is to get into Stanford. So all, all, I would advocate that for all crowds. Well, there you see. Well, there you go. Okay. But, 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 you know, so you're seeing the unwashed, unwashed passes on the, on the issuer on, side as well? On, on, so, on both sides. It's so, a matching process. It's a market in which it's a matching process. And, and um, you know, as anybody that's studying, you know, matching equilibria and mm -hmm. the like, uh, it's really easy to destroy mm -hmm. these markets through, through bad quality signals, either on the buy or the sell side. And by the way, I mean, once the crowdfunding rules go through, uh, it doesn't matter how we curate our platforms. There's going to be hundreds of these platforms, so everybody will find a place where they can hang up their shingle. But as I've heard you say before, and I very much agree, you know, AngelList exists in four years if investors are doing well, and you, the curation, the quality on the platform overall is the, the mark of a, of a sustainable business. So I, I think we, in the face of that competition, would maintain our standards for the curation because we would want to distinguish through market signals if you're looking for quality come to a place like this so what do you see as the future of you know crowdfunding this is the last question before we open up to q and I know there's a lot of questions but maybe a prediction next five years I mean maybe five years is too long in this market uh, but what do you think is going to happen with crowdfunding I think so much of it is up to the SEC rules that it's it's like trying to predict interest rates, uh, short-term interest rates next month. It's up to Ben Bernanke, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I think the rulemaking will have a huge effect on what kinds of things go out there. Uh, no matter how good the system is, uh, there will be spectacular fraud. There will be a case or two at least. And the nature of government and press is such that they can't tolerate any failure. So I wonder how we'll deal with that. Will there be a lynch mob mentality or will people be sort of more accepting about it? Um, and uh, I think there will be significant dollar volume that will move through crowdfunding over time. I mean, it, it could be tens of millions a month. Um, it will still be a small amount compared to what funds move because it's just the nature of investing that, uh, and it's true in the most liquid and, and the most public and the longest lived markets, that the majority of the money goes through funds, not through individual retail decisions. I agree a lot. It has to do with how the regulation comes out. Uh, I think it also depends on how you're defining crowdfunding. If you include platforms like Circle Up, uh, accredited and, and different uh, ways, individuals are being able to connect more efficiently through information technology online platforms. I think we're at the very beginning of a, of a long-term transformation. And in three to five years, you'll see a, a large number uh, of both platforms and issuers raising capital through, through online platforms. Wonderful opportunities for the integration of internet technology with capital formation uh, away from the technical definition of crowdfunding in the Jobs Act. And if you want to look at crowdfunding as defined by the Jobs Act, the question then becomes what's the probability that Congress has passed a statute as to which the SEC can write regulations that will create a vibrant entrepreneurial community 
I think the question answers itself. What about, I mean, you've been around and seen different phases of securities regulation mm -hmm. and attempts in different uh, eras or you know decades. I mean, what do you think of this? What do you think the SEC is going to do, or how should it act in, in the securities regulation? Well, they, I mean, I think I think Naval has really explained the dilemma that the agency faces. No matter what they do, they're going to get roundly criticized. Right? It's inevitable. Uh, if they come up with something that's you know balanced and down the middle, the the extreme libertarian crowdfund types are going to say this is unnecessary government intervention and this is going to stop the market from being a success. Uh, if they move in a very strong you know, uh, direction of whatever goes, all right, uh, mm -hmm. then everybody's going to yell about uh, whatever hap has happened to investor protection. Uh, we'll likely get some of the newspaper stories and the blow-ups and you know, the thalidomide syndrome uh, with the FDA would then kick in and you'll get amendments that will tighten things up. Uh, and then if you get, you know, very tight, strong per investor protection, um, you'll get an even more aggressive reaction from the thousands of people who are already in the crowdfunding business acting as intermediaries, thinking that they're going to make money, all right, uh, in the business of matching, all right, companies and, and suppliers of capital. I, I, I don't see this story, I don't see that part of the story as having a happy ending. The circle up in the angel list story, I definitely see as having a great future. Great. Okay, we're going to open up for questions. The microphones are, are on the aisles, so please line up and we'll start. Maybe we'll start over there. Yep. Hi. Hi, my name's, yeah. my name's Thad Langan. I work for Venture Docs. And I want to back up one of your your observations. You said 400 crowdfunding portals. I mean, that you count, Jonathan. You have a better number in your head over there. I want to pass the question to the room. This surprise all you guys. I want somebody to raise their hand if they're involved in a crowdfunding portal right now. Uh, there's one, two. There's two here. Three. Well, that's not the point. So you're in a room, and you got three of them right here. That just shows you his numbers. It's crazy. I find one every day, right? So um, oh, there's the, all kinds. There are people popping up to do the vetting. There are people popping up to do the yeah. centralized yeah. clearinghouse. There's like every possible variation. Right. Um, there's somebody popping up to say, "I'm going to claim." The I'm this piece. Right. I'm this yeah. piece. They think it's going to be eBay, basically, and, yeah, and exactly. they're going to build the next. So anyway, that, that was my observation for the rest of the folks here. Is there really are that many, and it's confusing. It's going to be really crowded space. So I agree with the uh, observation anyway. Great. I didn't, I, well, how many are here? <laughs> Question for the audience. John? <clears throat> um, hi. Uh, my name's Carl uh, Shergren. And actually, Joe, I had talked to you about an idea I was working on about 15 years ago, a company called Fairshare that had the idea of promoting a different type of capital structure for early stage companies that wanted to raise venture capital in a public offering, a registered offering, and it was a performance-based capital structure. Based on all the excitement that's been going on with the Jobs Act, I've decided to reprise the idea, and I'm, I'm working on <clears throat> a, a book to deal with it. But question- I'll, I'll just observe, 15 years, the statute of limitations has run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was an old idea coming back, <clears throat> for me at least. Um, for Rory and Naval, uh, what is your expectation? How, to what extent does valuation get? How does it get established on the deals that you're working on? How does it get communicated to the investors? And what are your general expectations for how these companies are going to raise their future rounds of capital? Evaluation is a negotiation between usually the lead investor and the company. So if the company comes in with a lead investor already in place, they'll have a valuation set and they're looking to fill out the round. That's the majority of companies that we deal with. And there is a minority that come in with no lead investor and we distribute them on AngelList, but generally they find the lead investor sets the round. Uh, there's a small number of companies where the company names a valuation and then investors sort of opt in or opt out. But even there, there's a lot of floating. 
Um, for the ones where we collect the money entirely online with a second market broker-dealer partnership, those companies already always have a lead investor and a price set at which that investor is investing money. Um, mm -hmm. So it's pre-negotiated. So we don't deal with that. We did play a tiny bit early on with trying to create uh, a demand curve. Um, so people saying this is the number which I'll invest and then top out and then out of that you can generate the demand curve. There's not enough liquidity around any single financing for that to actually work. So we discarded that pretty early. Same, where we have a lead investor for the majority of the cases that before they come on the platform, so it'll be a priced round. Um, we also, the most powerful in the case of, without a lead investor is not accepting them at a valuation, but companies set the valuation on the CircleUp platform uh, if they don't have a lead investor. Oh, sorry, all, all the all documents are available on the platform, so both the, the valuation, all the terms, uh, are, are presented right uh, to the investor. They can download the documents, consult with their uh, outside counsel and advisors. Do you disclose that the company has given itself a $5 million valuation? Yep, disclosed that valuations are set by the company uh, up, and here's the, here's the valuation, here's the, the multiple of all the financials, balance sheet, income statements, all available for the investors. Um, and I'd say of that 98% uh, of companies that we turn down in our size range, a lot of them will be around valuation issues, people coming with a high valuation in our view. Follow on, is there ever a point where the companies are rationalizing valuations where they say, we've given ourselves a $10 million valuation mm -hmm. and this is why, or is it just something that sort of this is the deal? Oh, it always comes out in the diligence for the investor. So we we organize a, a forum on the where investors are a, able to ask questions of the entrepreneur, especially if they're a little bit heady on the valuation piece. That will come out, and then they'll, the entrepreneur will have to, to justify it and explain how the, the methodology by which they, the valuation was determined. Okay, I have the my question. <laughs> yeah, my name is Dan Mueller. My company is Judo Baby Inc. Uh, I'll preface the question, then I'll ask it. So we raised four point two million locally. What, excuse me, uh, you, you've got my curious. What does Judo Baby do? We have nothing to do with Judo or babies. That's what I figured. I was hoping that that was we the make, answer. <laughs> we make video games. We put out a game with uh, dogs playing football with Jerry Rice and his dog in it. So it sounds ridiculous, right? But it actually brings boys and girls together and parents all playing in the same room, elbow to elbow. So it socializes the family, which child development specialists well, of course. will tell you is a forefront of child development right okay. now. Well, of bye, course you bye. call a judo baby. <laughs> Anyways, I'll, tell, I'll preface the question and I'll ask it. So we raised 4.2 million, 250 uh, local private investors. Uh, during the process of that, there was about three raises and two of them, all our investor could, investors could participate. But then in July, 2010, the change in credit investor status, removing the primary residence qualification. So a lot of our investors who are now retired, even though these are very smart individuals, very savvy and done very well in their lives, they were no longer allowed to reinvest in the company. So we had a development phase and then a publishing phase. I brought on publishing staff that built two different billion dollar game companies. This is very attractive to our investors. Most of them no longer allowed to invest. So I've been looking at the job act and I went to Washington too. Met the advisor of the president on business and economics, and blah, blah, blah. Point being, I've been waiting for Job Act to come through so that we can actually make some measure and that our current investors will be legally allowed to reinvest in the company that they built. So my that's my preface. So then the question is, I'm looking at 250 investors I have, and there's a lot of savvy and there's a lot of wisdom for me to tap into. But as this opens up, what I've seen through things like Kickstarter is that you get thousands of people that might jump into something, and there's some very smart people that tend to jump in. There's a lot of noise but there's a lot of cream that comes at the top. And that aggregate wisdom is educating people that really didn't know. They jumped in to get a hat and a game or something like this, but they're going, hey, that guy's got an interesting point. And I think I know why this thing failed. I might be a little smarter on my lunch money that I'm spending into this on my next investment. And instead of buying a share at $30 or Apple at 450, I might get it at 50 cents. And when that thing goes IPO on the 4,000 times, uh, 4,000 return on my investment, I'm gonna have a big win on my lunch money, right? And that means a lot to them. So I wonder what you think about that kind of cream rising to the top, aggregate wisdom uh, through something like a job act that opens it up to a larger source than even someone like me with aggregating just even 250 investors. I think there's a, dis there's a, there's a different, I'm not sure what the question was, what, what do you think about it? Um, well, one thing I think is that if you're if your investors are retired in Silicon Valley and their net worth is between one and one point six million dollars, then I would not qualify them as well to do. <laughs> this is a very expensive town, um, so it's unfortunate that you raised from a lot of investors who fell into that trap with that definition. Um, 
but I, I do think that if you get a thousand backers on Kickstarter, there are going to be some very intelligent people in there who can help you and you can learn a lot from them. But that's very different from if those thousand people went in thinking they're going to make money. And uh, you know your IPO example, it's great, but it's almost apocryphal. Like one out of a thousand, one out of ten thousand of these companies are going to go IPO. So most of them are going to lose their money. So there's a difference between there's being value to you from the cream at the top, and most of the investors losing their money and getting pretty angry about it. Uh, Kickstarter, even though they haven't really had any spectacular cases of fraud to date, um, nevertheless, if you go into the forums and you go to Pebble or any of the cases where they haven't shipped the product, you will see people row after row after row saying. I bought this product. Where is it? Why didn't they deliver it? They literally thought they were in a shopping mall. <laughs> they literally thought they were doing the e-commerce checkout. Um, so I, I know you believe Judo Baby is going to kick butt and Jerry Rice and his dog going to take you to the IPO, but it's kind of a long. It's, it's, not, it's not about that. I'm just saying yeah. through that wisdom, people get educated, even though they're not. I agree. I think it's. Yeah, I think it's better to lose small amounts of money before before you go on to lose big amounts of money in life. You know, it's a it's a good way to learn. No, but uh, you know, I I think what you presented is the best case, all right, and and you know that's the happy face scenario. Uh, but we know from lots of experience in many other markets that 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 tends not to be the dominant equilibrium scenario, all right, because uh, again, I'll. Uh, it, you just told me about driving Miss Daisy, all right? And then everybody goes out and everybody tries doing driving Miss Daisy and Judo Baby and in the aggregate, uh, you know, things for the community as a whole. I'm more talking about learning from those failures because then you know you have a better shot to win from the road. Fully understand the risk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, hi, John and Sam, uh, the Crowd Cafe. Uh, quick question for Naval and Rory. You guys both announced a partnership with Second Market, which I thought was pretty interesting because for primary transactions. Um, do you see three to five years a more liquid secondary market for early stage securities? And if that's the case, how does that change the relationship um, with investors? And then Joe, um, so when you, feel, I feel like you're looking at you have accredited investors and then everybody else, but do you feel there's an opportunity to really take private sector innovation and bridge that gap? You know, for example, in the UK, there is a crowdfunding platform called Funding Circle um, that's open to non-accredited and accredited investors. It's mm -hmm. largely liquidated by institutional capital accredited, but not accredited or participating. They've crowdfunded over $100 million, 1,400 small business loans, um, and, and really private sector innovation has done that. Do you see opportunities for that um, on the startup side as well as the small mm -hmm. business side in the US? Yeah, guys, you go first. I, I do think there will be increasing. I mean, if essentially these are long-term illiquid investments, and, and uh, certain investors will want liquidity ahead uh, of the company. I think what we've seen over time is companies want to control that. Uh, you know, there's a, a big issue for as private companies who's holding your shares. Um, so it's it's an issue that the industry will will have to tackle. We'll have to work closely with issuers. I think that's what's going on a lot with second market and shares post over the last few years, but. As the, the number of private shareholders increases through crowdfunding or, or otherwise, that's a, a pain point that, that needs to be addressed with a market-based solution. Yeah, at least at the moment, uh, the demand for secondary liquidity is going up from early employees or from insiders, and the demand from outsiders to buy those secondary shares is going up, but the supply is drying up. The supply is drying up because the companies and their boards of directors want to con do control liquidity. They want to know who's in the cap table. They want to know who's buying it. They want to make sure that buyers informed. They want to keep it close. And so a lot of these companies are, are writing it into their charter or into their founding documents that there will be no secondary liquidity. And I'm involved with a number of companies that are extremely successful and there's huge secondary demand for them. And I'm, I'm usually a minor investor. In, I get the documentation that says, by the way, we're changing everything so that you will not be able to sell your stock early until you know six months after the IPO, et cetera. Um, and would you please voluntarily sound, sign this, you know, parentheses, or you'll never work in this town again, right? Uh, and so you kind of just go ahead and you do it. So these companies are closing up. So I don't know where the supply is going to come from. I think even second market has switched towards controlled liquidity on behalf of the companies uh, that they're helping get a secondary for. So. Um, let me give you a question, but let me let me give it a little bit of a different answer than you might expect. I'm profoundly dissatisfied with the SEC's definition of a, an accredited investor. And the reason for that is it works on the presumption that if you have money, you're smart. Well, you know, again, those of us in Silicon Valley probably know a person or two 
where that's, that's not true, all right? Uh, and it works on the assumption, which is also very interesting in Silicon Valley, that if you don't have money, you're not smart. That's also not true. And I think if, the, if, you, if you ask me, well, what's the innovation that the SEC could come up with that could really open this market up in an interesting way, I wouldn't look at this crowdfunding stuff and all of this other stuff. I'd say, let's really look at the objective of the definition of accredited investor, and let's come up with a definition that, that primarily allows people who should be able to fend for themselves. That's a term we teach here at the law school, or right? it comes out of a Supreme Court opinion, who can fend for themselves in a particular investment, invest a reasonable amount of money where you should believe that they've got appropriate expertise. So suppose you've got a postdoc in computer science, all right, and they're in the database area, and they see a wonderful big data startup, but they're not a millionaire yet, all right? That makes it hard for them to put in a $10,000 investment. That's stupid, all right? We should be able to figure out some way to make that work. And, it, and, and, it, and if you said, well, all right, what would you do to kind of open up this space? I would look at the definition of accredited investor. I would try to sever this assumption that, that you're only smart if you're rich, all right, and try to open this market up, you know, on a segmented basis. You've got expertise in this area. All right, here's how you demonstrate your expertise. Great. We will let you invest as though you are accredited in your area of expertise. So, Joe, that's a brilliant idea. The problem is like if a government's giving exams or or if it's like the O-1 visa process where you're trying to prove okay. someone's a uh, genius. I, I agree. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> but what's no, but what's interesting is I believe it's either it's either Singapore, I think it's Singapore that has their accredited investor rules written that way. Sophistication based. So it's sophistication based, all right, and obviously, you know, huge implementation issues. But there's definitely more that can be done to juice the investment process that way, and that would address judo, baby, right? Absolutely. Well, there you go. I love it. Thank you. Um, so so this, these are real problems. There are solutions, but they're not in the JOBS Act. By the way, one of the things we find on Angelus is that the people who are taking the small dollar route, working with, through our broker-dealer online relationship and putting in the two $3,000 check, um, they're usually former entrepreneurs. Um, they're usually former entrepreneurs who've had a small exit. Maybe they made one or two million bucks. They haven't made the 10 or 20. They're not going to put in 100K into a startup, but they want to put in two, three, 4K into their friend's startup, who they usually already know. Mm -hmm. But it's too hard for the friend to take it in the cap table directly, so they go through the BD relationship mm -hmm. and fund formation process. So it, they are experienced in the space. They're sophisticated in that sense. There's, and they should be allowed in. Yeah. Yeah. We've got questions, probably two more questions. I'm going to go this side. <clears throat> So uh, I come at this from a different perspective. I'm Jacob Modell, I'm a graduate student at the Stanford GSB, and I actually study uh, uh, crowdfunding on the nonprofit side, which is m both much older and has the unique feature that every investor loses all their money. Uh, well, at least it's fair. It's true. But uh, well, one of the things that I study is the social dynamics on these sites, uh, and particularly uh, how one investor might pay attention to some of either the crowd, the wisdom of the crowd information, or other uh, specific people that they might have social ties to. I was curious, just in your experience running some of these um, on the for-profit side, you know, if what sort of dynamics do you see, and how do people react to information, given that the stakes are slightly different? You know, if you're putting capital and expecting a return, versus if you're putting in capital and expecting impact. Yeah, I mean, at least at the moment, we've finessed it by uh, making sure there's a solid lead investor in every case. And so even the smaller investors are queuing off that signal. Um, uh, there's not as much commentary or discussion uh, on our site as there is, say, on a Kickstarter kind of thing, because there isn't that same passionate intensity around the po project and, and the desire to engage the creator. Um, that said, I think we're going to see more and more of that. We're going to have to kind of meld the two models a little bit, if you will. Yeah, we've done some some qualitative and quantitative work with our investors uh, about how often they're checking the site or, or what information they may be looking at. It's hard to see without the qualitative side of, of interviewing. And there is some interactivity between the investors for sure. Some investors 
uh, particularly those who have made multiple investments on the platform uh, do. Um, there's some follow-on effect on that, but for the most part, we see investors going about doing their work uh, on on the investment themselves. So hearing from them saying, you know, I'm, I'm researching, I went out to the store, tried the product, I'm, I'm working my way through the, the diligence materials provided. Um, so I, I don't know if there, it's a good answer, but there, there is uh, elements of both the free thinker and, and the, the social investor. Uh, hi, um, I'm uh, Bowen from a student at the Stanford GSB. Um, I was interested to uh, hear the panel's thoughts on um, using the crowdfunding model as a way to re-engage the local businesses. Um, kind of uh, think of it as uh, the Kiva Zip, but like an equity model of that. Um, and just as an effective way of uh, keeping businesses that we might love locally to, to stay open and actually help them. So um, as an example, I think Hobie's recently closed. Um, which is a much beloved restaurant uh, in uh, Pyongyang country. Um, but yeah, interested to hear your thoughts. By the way, Hobie's is a bad business because obviously it went, went under, right? So you, who's going to keep it open? Even if you love it, like should you know so, someone going to put in a thousand bucks each time and then next you know next month they get the sure. and it's gone, right? Yeah. It's, it's so that, that may be a bad example, but um, but as a general way of really trying to re-engage the local businesses. I think that's the that's the promise. I mean, that's, that, promise, that's what yeah. people have been. Uh, touting for the Jobs Act and the the idea of, of a large number of, of community oriented investors in certain cases, I think when the expectations are are given appropriately and and it's a, it leads to an interesting model whether it's it's equity quasi debt or some other financial instrument having the ability of small contributions towards a larger go collective goal is compelling and is is something that crowdfunding is on, on the, the Beginnings of, I think what Professor Grunfest will, will, is, will be say quickly is it gets complicated in, in securities law quickly, with investor returns, investor protection. When you're having using a financial instrument, it, it becomes a lot more complicated than the donation-based model or Akiva out there. And the key is investor expectations uh, and the responsibility you have by taking on external capital to them. You know, I, I think the question that you've asked is a great one, and I wish I had an answer that, that was worthy of the question, because I can imagine lots of situations where uh, there are businesses that generate positive social externalities, mm -hmm. and people are willing to take a below market return in order to keep that business going in their community. Now, personally, I don't know that I would pick Hobie's as Exhibit A. Uh, maybe Kepler's, all right, the old-fashioned bookstore, all right, on El Camino, all right, which has had trouble and had to downsize, you know, and, and you know, uh, I, I'm always waiting for somebody to open up a nice scotch bar, all right, in the neighborhood with good single malts, all right, and, you know, maybe I would do a little bit of a uh, crowdfunding investment in a good scotch bar, all right, uh, in downtown Palo Alto. Um, uh, and, and in many ways, that is the vision of, of what could be great through the idea of crowdfunding. Um, that's, that's, that's my vision of the at driving the, At the same case. time, you'd have to be completely nuts to invest money in a primarily cash-based business. Uh, well, <laughs> well, yeah, that's because you understand how the skim works. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As Charlie Munger says, the greatest technical innovation uh, you know, in history for the investor was a cash register. Uh, and double entry bookkeeping, right? So you can at least track some of the money and well, where it goes. Well, you what see, that, cash what, what you don't realize is you've, you've just triggered one of my favorite stories. So you're going you're gonna to get a digression over here. <laughs> how many of you remember Crazy Eddie? All right, the retailer oh, yeah, in New yeah. York. Okay, how many of you guys are from New York and you remember the ads? All right, oh, do the imitation of the ad. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on, you put your hand up. Our prices are insane. insane. All right? It's Crazy go. Eddie. All right? So this character come on, he was Crazy Eddie. Our prices are insane. So the company goes public and it turns into the largest IPO fraud all right, in history at the time. All right? And what they did is they showed a tremendous increase in their profitability. All right? you know, per store profitability, the numbers were absolutely spectacular. All right? What was the major technique that they used in order to generate this tremendous growth rate? Sorry? They were selling for themselves. They were no, that was the inventory fraud that they did later when the first fraud ran out. <laughs> it takes more than one fraud to float Crazy Eddie. They didn't call him Crazy Eddie for nothing. All right, so I'll give you a hint. It ties off of Naval's observation. Cash. All right, what they were doing, like, like every retail merchant in New York, they were skimming. 
All right, so what were they doing? They were skimming, which meant they took money to the side so they wouldn't have to pay sales tax, all right? And they took the cash, and you know, there are places you can put cash in New York, all right? Uh, if you're interested, come see me. Um, <laughs> there are places where you can put cash in New York. And what they realized is with the multiples that Wall Street was providing, if you had gr appropriate growth rates, if they simply stopped skimming, if they stopped stealing from themselves, <laughs> they'd be able to show increased growth rate, uh -huh. all right? And that way they'd be able to take the company public at a higher multiple. So they figured out that it made sense to stop stealing from themselves to show the multiple, all right? And that actually got past due diligence, all right, in the IPO. All of which is a very good story to support Naval's observation about the dangers of funding cash businesses. All right, it's, 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 you know, sure, I mean, it can be done, um, but the amount of controls and the issues that arise, you know, So, so this is you, the danger. If, 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 there, if there is no sophisticated outside investor involved with a company, if there is no one on their board who has a stake in the company, who's going to watch to make sure the founders aren't buying themselves cars, going on vacations, um, skimming money off to the side, maybe paying marked up fees to their brother's software company and all that stuff. There's, there's no way to know. That stuff would be so easy to pull off. So the real uh, you know, fraud potential here is not that someone just makes up a complete fabrication, runs off with your million bucks, it's that they raise your million bucks and then slowly siphon it out in such a way that it's untraceable. There's a million ways to do it. So well, it was a failure. All right, and, and, and well, you know. By the way, this happens with angels too. This happens in Silicon Valley. It's not well advertised, but it, it has happened and it will happen. But at least there you have local people, you have some reputation, you have some trust, you know this guy, I worked with him, and they have someone going to a board meeting, hopefully. But that would be all in this case as well. And that's where I think that becomes really interesting. And the social connectivity of the last five years, all those reputational effects can be enforced. And well, the, I mean, in, in the local immigrant communities, when they first come to the United States, they often cannot borrow money from the banks. And so they go into these pools where they throw in money together and they lend it to one person in the group, maybe at the church or whatever. And then, you know, once every 10 years, somebody in that group runs off back to the home country with the cash. <laughs> so it's a, it, it does regulate, but it's a trust-based market. Thank All right. Well, great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And thank you.